Before we start this episode, I want to take a minute to say thank you for listening. Knowing that people are hearing these episodes and getting value from this podcast makes me strive to keep improving it. At the moment, a lot of you are just numbers on my stats page, so get in touch via the Facebook group or by email at kane at musiciansmap.org and let me know you're there, let me know who you are, but also let me know what you want to hear on the next podcast. Talking about statistics, looking at my page last week, my second biggest group of listeners behind the USA, love you guys, come from Japan. It kind of blows my mind, so arigato gozaimasu to my Japanese listeners, and please get in touch to say hello. As a way of saying thank you, I want to offer you my new ebook for free. It's called How to Get Your Music Heard, and can be downloaded at musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book. I hope you find it useful. Hello and welcome to the Musicians Map podcast. I'm Kane Power. Playing music with other people is one of the greatest joys you will know as a musician. When people come together to make music and it clicks, everyone in the room can experience such primal joy it's hard to explain with words which is generally why we do it with music. It's shared expression, a shared experience among only those involved at that exact moment, and it can be truly special. Often a rehearsal room is a safe space to immerse yourself in sound and express everything you can't quite say in any other way. You might never sound as good as you do in the rehearsal room. Another advantage of playing with others is that you become a much better musician. You have to learn how to adapt, improvise, collaborate, sacrifice, and everything else that comes with sharing. Playing with others forces you to improve. So why is it so often difficult? Why do so many bands churn through members and break up after a few shows? And if you manage to find a group that works, how do you make sure it keeps working? This week, we're talking about the dynamics of being in a band, creativity and teamwork. We discuss the different roles of playing in a group, how to deal with egos, and why self-awareness is essential to collaboration. We also touch on creative control and royalties. It's a huge topic, and my guest this week, Laura Thompson, is the perfect expert to help us through it. Laura is a musician and sound engineer from New Zealand. She plays guitar and vocals in a band called Cheshire Grimm, and also operates as a solo loop artist under the name Ms. Take. She has been a prolific bassist over the past 12 years, and often plays as a session bassist and or backing vocalist with other bands, doing everything from death metal to reggae and hip-hop. Her experience in the audio engineering field spans everything from live theatre to television, to studio recording and producing, to mixing bands on the road and everything in between. We caught up over Skype. Laura, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. One of the first things that you need to get right when you know when you start making music with other people is the people themselves, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you're not going to get very far if you end up with people, you know, heading in different directions uh, with different motivations, and it can actually be harder than it seems to put together a group or a partnership that actually works for any length of time. So that's kind of where I want to start is with actually finding the right people to make music with. Um, how, how do you kind of go about it? What's been, what's been your approach in the past? Um, yeah, well, I've, I guess to start off with a little bit about me, like I've been involved in a number of projects um, and often, you know, multiple projects at the same time, like being someone who plays different instruments. So I guess for some people, um, you know, they are really lucky and they – um, start a band in high school, you know, you, you get these scenarios that are quite common and then they stay in the same band for that whole time and they grow together and learn together, which is really cool. For those of us that either picked it up later in life or perhaps have uh, gone between different projects and that kind of thing, like sometimes it requires a bit of adaption. And, you know, people don't always grow together. 
Mm. Like sometimes you can work in a project for four or even five years and then sort of go, okay, well, we're actually, we were in the same place when we started this project, but now we're not. Yeah. And that's okay. I feel like um, both, was it Muse and Coldplay, both were high school friends and they started out as kids. I mean, I'm sure there's loads of others, but those two come to mind and they're still together now. So that's kind of, I guess, making music with your friends is the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ideally, um, there has to be a friendship, I think, in order for, if you're talking about longevity uh, in that sort of, even, even, in New Zealand music, you know, I can think of quite a few examples of bands where longevity, long, long-standing friendships have been a huge part of the reason why things are working for them. And it can be difficult, especially when you're an adult already coming into a new situation to try and build those friendships. And, um, you know, if you can collaborate with people you're already friends with and already share a relationship with, on some level, that's a great advantage because you don't have to get to know. It can be a bit like dating, I guess. Like, you know, if, if you've been in a relationship for a long time, you know a lot about the person and you know how to approach certain matters with the person. Uh, whereas if it's a, someone you don't know, it's a whole new person to learn. So Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've, I've actually done that a couple of times, you know, with, with longstanding friends and it, it ends up um, – well, a lot of the time it ends up, you know, that situation when say you move in with, with an old friend or like a, yeah. a long-term friend and you move in with them. And then when you actually live with them, um, you discover all of these little things that kind of really bug you. Um, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's happened to me in a, in a band a couple of times, you know, you start a band with your best mates and then you realize that, uh, <laughs> I don't know, he's really pissing me off right now. Um, yeah. but I guess that, yeah, you can get through it. So, okay. What about if, if none of your mates make music? Um, or what about if you don't want to make music with your friends? Um, mm. have, have you kind of, have you made any other, like joined other bands through other approaches with randoms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I think uh, growing up as a teenage girl, none of my friends really wanted to make music. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, and I assume that a lot of female musicians are probably similar in that they would push themselves out of their comfort zone initially to maybe collaborate with people other than their best friends. Mm. Um, whereas I think it's a more common thing for teenage boys to kind of build that, that friendship, um, build it from the friendship rather. But yeah, I think one of the situations I've had, um, that I found interesting was I do as well as writing my own music and playing guitar and stuff, I play the bass, um, as you know, and often get asked to fill in or do kind of session work and that kind of thing on the bass and um yeah I've joined a few bands that were existing established bands that had lost their bass player and you know there might be an existing friendship with the members there but it is very different once you start working together with them in a band context rather than kind of like I'm just a session player like I'm just here to do what you tell me um you know to, to help you out for these shows or whatever and it can be difficult for some people to recognise that um, that line or to go, okay, well, yeah, we are actually just looking for someone who plays what we want. We've already written all the parts, you know. Um, I've been in a couple of those situations as well. Um, one of the bands in particular that I joined years ago, um, they came to me with an album and said, hey, we need a drummer to record the album. Um, and so same as you, you know, I did, I did a session with them um, and tracked the album and it was after the album that they asked me to join the band and, um, but in that situation, you know, I was there was zero creative input on my behalf. Mm. Um, they'd, they'd written the drum parts, you know, and they said, this is what you play. And then we toured and it was, this is what you play. Um, you know, mm. and these are our old songs. And we never got to the point where, where we wrote new songs. We broke up. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's a lot different, I guess, to, to forming your own band, something maybe you've got a bit of, of heart in. Um, mm do you kind of do you feel that like but the bands that you've formed are, are more special i suppose yeah it's interesting because um like obviously to me they are and to any creative person um you're always going to kind of like hopefully really like most of the stuff you you create so it's it's kind of a different feel but then when you sort of take what other people say and look at things from an outsider perspective um 
which I do a lot and I have a few close friends uh, who aren't necessarily in the music industry but can give that kind of neutral opinion of, you know, I really liked this project because blah, 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 or I really think that this band of yours is better than this other band of yours because I really like X, Y, Z about that. Um, and, you know, that can be in itself kind of a a weird criticism because obviously you want your personal creative output to be valued, um, but that's not always the case. Like when you're looking at the whole package of the music that you're making and who you're making it for and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, in, in a short answer, I, do, I feel a, a large sense of value as a songwriter over my own creations, um, absolutely. But I think there's room for all sort of levels of existence within teams and projects. And as long as you're going into it with the awareness of the situation of what your role is, then it, it can be, you know, absolutely fulfilling just to turn up and play the songs and have a great time. You know, that's that's a whole lot less work. Yeah, would you would you rather play in a in a successful group with someone else doing writing all of the songs and have no creative input, or um, play in a much less successful group and have full creative control? Yeah, well, that's an interesting um, topic. That actually, I saw a really good couple of online conversations popping about that over the last few days in a couple of online uh, forums, and I don't think. Like for me, I like both. <laughs> I'm happy to do both. I mean, if I like the songs that someone else has written, you know, that's enough for me. Mm. I'm I'm not like I've got to be in control and I've got to do everything my way, etc. Because I find that that can end up being a really stressful situation where you are kind of doing everything, and that's not good either. Because then you have very little time to actually create. But yeah, there's there's certainly there's certainly pros to eat the side, really. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think when it comes down to it, I guess um, if your creative endeavor, you know, your personal creative endeavor, isn't as successful as the other one, you can just um, enjoy both aspects if you're lucky enough to have it. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. What are some ways to to make sure that the people that you are working with um, are the right kind of people? This is all stuff I've personally learned through trial and error. So I would <laughs> love to, <laughs> I would love to pass this knowledge on to, to people so they don't have to go through it. But, you know, human beings are human beings. And often we say one thing and do another, or we change our minds or, uh, you know, other circumstances come into play. People have, uh, other projects that they suddenly feel more passionate about. Yeah. People have babies. People have uh, other big life uh, situations, and it's not always practical for everyone to put the band or the music first in their life the entire time. And I guess as long as whatever side of the fence you sit on with that, whether you're the one that might have other commitments or they like, as long as everybody's upfront and honest about. Uh, what level of input they're willing to have, um, then that's okay. But, I mean, obviously there's got to be a certain line, like if someone's not turning up to practices and, um, <laughs> you know, like I've, I had one dr drummer who texted us on the morning of a gig and it was pretty much a sold-out gig, like sold out at a pretty small venue. But, yeah, it was kind of like, uh, sorry, I can't play tonight. And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> That's pretty short notice. Um, so yeah, we had to we had to get our old drummer back for that show. And obviously, if it's yeah that sort of situation um, where you can only commit to maybe turning up sometimes, you know, I think then you're collaborating with the wrong person. Obviously, you need to get someone else who's more reliable. Mm. I guess you can start by having if it is a band situation, uh, start by having a meeting. And just talking about where you want to head with it, I think planning one to two years in advance, as boring as that sounds, it can be really helpful, um, even if the plan changes in that time. But just having a rough idea of um, what's coming up, you know, that you might need to commit to financially or, 
uh, time, you know, say if people want to do an album, et cetera, something like that, you know, that takes time. Like you've got to take time out from your day job and family or whatever to do that. And just, yeah, really getting a feel for what everyone what everyone's sort of life is doing over the next little bit is a, is a really underrated approach, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I really, I really can um, can agree with what you're saying, um, especially the honesty part. That's, mm. I mean, it's so it's so integral, and people are afraid to be honest um, because honesty mm. can can be hard to say sometimes. Um, and we're going to talk about that more about dealing with people, um, but. On the kind of topic that we were just discussing, I I had a, a guy playing with us um, that he joined our band and and he was a random, a total random person that we found on the internet. Um, and after after a few kind of auditions and hanging out and drinking together, you know, getting to know each other, we got along really well. So we're like, this guy's a great fit for our band. And we did all of the things that you talked about. We thought that we were totally honest with him um, and him with us. Mm. We had meetings, you know, we had. We did the plan. Um, we, you know, talked about what we needed to commit financially. Um, but then, in the middle of a tour, um, we were doing consecutive, you know, four day kind of weekend tours, three in a row. Um, and after the first one, the morning that we were supposed to leave, he did the same thing that as as your drummer did to you, and just said, "I can't, yeah. I, I can't get my money." Um, I can't come on tour. And it's like, come on, man, like we've got the van, it's loaded. Like we're literally yeah. about to leave on tour. You know, we need you. Uh, and he just didn't do it. And so we ended up touring without him. Um, and it was kind of weird. Um, and obviously that was the end of, of the band. But I'm, I guess my point is that even though it seemed out, seemed like everything we were doing was right, um, we couldn't really account for every situation. And, and it, when it came down to it, it was honesty that was sort of, between us because he wasn't being entirely honest about, you know, his situation. I think one sort of important factor that we don't really account for because it's not talked about is like, you know, I've been reading this really great book. It's called Living with a Creative Mind by Jeff and Julie Crabtree. Um, and I would recommend that book to anyone who feels that they've ever experienced any kind of issues with their creativity or, uh, you know, mental health and that kind of thing in the industry. Yep. Um, because I think it's something that's not really talked about so much when it comes to dealing with creative people, but, you know, they tend to have really up and down lives. Like we tend to be, especially if we're not working full time or we're not making much money off what we're doing and all that sort of thing. Like, um, a lot of, a lot of those sort of situations, um, you know, lead to, I suppose, mental health or, or drug and alcohol sort of issues or issues that can affect reliability um, and and mood and, and willing to participate in a band uh, as well. And, and many people don't really want to kind of openly talk about those issues when they're affecting them mm. or when, when they're going through it. So it's, it's pretty important to kind of start thinking about that and start having those conversations. And, and, and also from the other side of it, if someone opens up to you this is the reason why I'm unavailable to do X, Y, Z, or, you know, um, I'm experiencing these, these personal issues right now to, to not kind of just dismiss that and go, okay, cool. Well, we're going to get on with, with stuff. Like if you really care about keeping the person in your band, I think it's important to at least acknowledge, um, your role in, in supporting them, I guess, through whatever means you can. Yeah. 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 I mean, I I guess I hadn't even really thought about it. You, you're putting all of these artists in a room together and we're all intrinsically kind of artists, I suppose. Everything that comes with it, you know, there's emotions and there's kind of um, all these sort of demons that are artistic traits um, that we're all dealing with and personality types. Um, and then you throw them all together and kind of expect to just get along um, and for everything to, to go swimmingly and eventually um, you're going to come across problems. Thinking about, thinking about roles, how, how, do you know, how do you know your role? So, so when, you, when you kind of are, are in a group, um, is it just a natural thing? Like, you know, say you're, you're a songwriter, do you step forward and go, right, this is, this is my idea, this is the way that things are going? How, do you, how does that kind of work, do you think? I actually didn't really 
start songwriting until very late in my kind of musical being. Like I started out um, more joining other people's bands and, uh, you know, playing the bass or learning their songs on, you know, guitar or that sort of thing. So I feel like if you're starting a project from scratch, you know, uh, finding someone you can write with or a team of people you can write with, even if you're a solo artist and you're working with like a producer, um, it's so, so good because trying to write and do everything yourself without having another person to bounce ideas off and to kind of give you that perspective on your ideas is, is so challenging. Like, and I realize that there are some people that love to write whole songs and just go, yep, that's it. It's done. I don't want to change it. You know, I'm happy with that, how it is. And that's great. If you, if you can find people that want to work with you like that and you have enough confidence inside yourself to go, okay, I'm happy with the song and I don't want to change it, then that's great. But, um, yeah, you're, you're probably a solo artist or a, you know, a, mm. a person that works on their own, I guess, in that instance. And, and for most people, I think when it comes to writing in a group and, or in bands, you generally one or two people will bring the main initial ideas. But um, from my my kind of perspective and process, I because I've come from the other side of not having a lot of writing input in my earlier years, you know, I try to make it a real team process. Um, I don't even necessarily supply the initial idea. Like uh, one of the Cheshire Grimm songs that we released not long ago was actually a riff that my old drummer came to me with and he was like, I came up with this and it's really cool. And he's like, oh, you probably aren't going to like it. And so I went home and I played over that riff for like a couple of hours and I changed it a little bit and I was like, you know, this is really cool. And he's not a guitarist, but I was like, you know, this is really cool. We can make us, we can make a song out of this. Mm. You know, there's no rules, I guess is what I'm trying to, trying to put across there. There's no like, there shouldn't be rules of like the guitarist has to write the guitar and the, you know, yeah. vocalist has to write the vocals, etc. If you, if you can find a system that works, where everyone feels like they have enough input, then that's that's the main the main goal. As long as you're happy with the the work that you're producing and and it's you're writing good songs, then it yeah. shouldn't be about ownership, you know. Yeah, um, I want to come back to a point you mentioned before that maybe um, if you are the sort of person that is writing a song and getting the entire song and you're like, yep, that's it, I'm happy with it, then maybe you should be a solo artist. Because um, mm-hmm. I think isn't that the reason why why we seek other people to make music with why we join bands is because we want that um collaboration and and because we want to bounce ideas off other people it's not you know in some circumstances i know people form bands because they want someone to back them um yep. but but generally i think most musicians are, are looking for collaboration um lo- and looking for kind of support and looking for peers the, yeah, I've certainly played bass for solo artists and and people who've written. Um, I've played on people's albums and things like that. And there are kind of a varied amount of different approaches that people take. Some of them go, I've written the whole song, here's the bass line, just play that. And that's, okay, cool, yep, that's fine. Or um, down to, yeah, I've done sort of backing vocals for people and they have no idea what they want and they I end up kind of arranging it all mm. and... I guess doing a backing vocal arrangement as well as actually recording um, on the songs. And in that case, I guess, when it comes to credits and royalties and that kind of thing, if you're the person that's performing that sort of work and they're not paying you, um, I would say, you know, you you deserve an arranging credit of some kind uh, um, just for putting in that extra work. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Before before we head, <laughs> head down that road... Um, credits and royalties and stuff. Um, I want to go back to another thing that you talked about before um, and talking about teamwork. What's a good way to encourage like creativity as a team? You said you, you know, like you gave the example of using your drummer's riff. Um, What's another kind of example? What's another way of doing that? Like just be self-aware. Some people have very naturally dominating or, um, like big personality people and some people are shyer and, and maybe they're less experienced songwriters and that kind of thing, but it doesn't mean that they don't have great ideas. So if you're a person that's completely comfortable in this, 
the scenario and you feel like you're dominating the scenario, you probably are. Yeah. And like maybe just be a bit self-aware and go, okay, I haven't heard any opinions from, you know, this person in a while and they've been in the room for the last two hours with us, you know, and then just say, what do you think? Mm. Like, and it's that simple. And they, if they are, you know, really shy and non-confrontational, they might say, oh, well, I think X, Y, Z, or if they actually really hate it and, they, and they're not shy, then they might just actually speak up and go, yeah, no, no I don't like what you're doing there. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> yeah. Could have told us two hours ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but you find that often if you don't ask people, sometimes they won't say anything. And that's really common as well. So what about um, Cheshire Grimm? How do, you, how do you guys approach um, the creative process together? Do you have specific writing sessions or is it all done in rehearsal? Um, because of our, I guess, geographical situation, um, not always living in or not always being in the same place, um, we like there's two main songwriters, which is me and Kat. Um, Kat is an amazingly talented, amazingly refined songwriter. She's one of these people that could just bring whole ideas to the table and they're, they're complete. Um, and she does do that every now and then. Um, whereas I tend to, yeah, write a few ideas and then want to bounce them off people more. Mm. So we do a fair bit of writing on our own as well. And um, what we've actually just done for our, I guess, upcoming record is we got together and we tried to write 50 songs, uh, between us before we got together or, you know, rough ideas, not complete Okay. Songs. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that's a um, lot. <laughs> yeah. So we set ourselves a huge target of having all these ideas and then we kind of refined them back down to, um, I think we've got 10 or 12 that we actually demoed. And what we did is lock ourselves away for three or four days in a house to kind of sort that out, <laughs> to oh. kind of go, these are our ideas. And because we were in a situation where, um, our current drummer's just joined the project and he isn't contributing so much to the actual songwriting yet. Uh, we just, we forgot about drums for that little bit of time and we just kind of went, okay, we're going to go one for one. So give us your idea. Now I'll give you my idea, etc. And then we demoed out our, just, just all day for 12 hours a day until we had a listen back and went, yeah, I like that. No, I don't like that. Mm. Yeah. Wow. That seems that seems like a um, an amazing thing to do. I've never done that before. In some of um, some of my previous projects, I have um, I've kind of encouraged a writing session once a week. Um, yeah. So either whoever the primary songwriters are um, will get together in a room, or the entire band will get together in a room. But it would probably just be like a lounge, you know, someone's lounge, um, and mm. we'll we'll all grab guitars or or whatever, whoever can play whatever instrument. Um, and just, and yeah, throw around ideas. We probably would have been, usually the guitarist would have been working on some ideas as guitarists do. Um, and yeah. he would bring a few and would, would mess with them and that would be the writing session. And then whatever came from the writing session, we would take to the rehearsal session in a full band rehearsal room. Um, and that way we weren't messing around with, you know, standing in the, in the band room kind of going, what do you think of this riff? What about yeah. what about uh, this riff? Now nah, we all hate all of those riffs. Okay, well, um, let me <laughs> let me come up with something. You know, I'll I'll stand here for the next twenty minutes and force something. It just never yeah. it never works well. I don't think. Um, so I'd always encourage that kind of considered approach. I think. Uh, yeah, there's also a lot you can do. I guess by a lot to be said for just um, when you get that moment of an idea, you can just record it on your phone. And yeah. send it to you know the other people or person, yeah, and kind of wait for them to listen to it and and offer feedback, and that can be a really useful tool, especially if you um, you know, like you're driving in the car, you're like, oh, that's a cool melody in my head or whatever, and I, I don't have any way of <laughs> of recording it right now, but you've got your phone usually on you or um, you know, stuff like that where you can just sort of quickly stop and go, yep, that's that's a new idea I want to put forward, or yeah. That that's um that's not to be underestimated that and that's why people keep notepads next to their bed writing down your ideas as they come because you never remember them later you don't you you'll you'll get home after being in the car and finding that melody in your head and you'll go oh i had a melody what was it uh, i can't remember oh well whereas if you did pull out your phone and you know yeah. 
actively kind of just pulled over and sung the melody, you know, it took five seconds and then continued, you might have come up with something really great. Mm. So what about what about egos? How do you firstly how do you deal with someone that that has a, a massive ego um, and you know that's in your group? Egos are really interesting because they they go both ways. They go low and high. And I think you can, you'll find sometimes the people that have the biggest egos or are seeming to be egotistical about a certain topic. Um, I, I kind of find most of those people are fluctuating on a large scale between extremely confident and not confident at all. Um, and I think to some degree, a lot of creative people are. Um, and it's something to be aware of because something you could say to someone or have said to you when the, you're at the highest point in your ego and you're thinking like, yeah, this is awesome, I'm the shit, could come across as really arrogant. And then the next day, if you're feeling totally like crap or, um, you know, you, yeah, it's just so fluid. And so I guess in that instance, I would say as hard as it is, um, take comments with a grain of salt where possible. Um, I certainly am someone that takes things quite personally, like really personally. And so I guess in the past that's been uh, a massive learning curve for me is just learning to go, okay, yeah, well, you just said that, but it's because you're just having this ego trip right now. Yeah, you're, you know, on, your, you're, you're on a just, crest. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're out there and you've just got to let it pass, you know, and um, and there's all kinds of other dynamics that can play into that, obviously, I, sp- I suppose as well, depending on what your role is in the band and how – how satisfied you feel with your input and all that stuff to begin with. Yeah. Um, well, that can make it seem like a huge, a huge problem. And yeah, I think if you, if you're aware that you maybe just be really aware of your own ego fluctuations, you know, and, and, and what environments you're like, I'm pretty well known amongst like some of my mates for getting super, like super egotistical in the studio and super fussy. And it, it comes from the, the point of view of just like, I want the recording to be as good as it can be. Like, sure. But I'm aware that that's what it is. You know what I mean? Like when I'm when I'm there, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to be a total bitch about these things that are outside of my control because I know that that's how I can be mm. from experience. For someone who's got less experience, I would just say, yeah, just check yourself (laughs) like yeah yeah maybe maybe you're a great songwriter and you're frustrated because the person you're working with is learning how to write songs um if you want to keep working with that person it's in your best interest to be patient you know it's not in your best interest to go okay well screw you then i'll just do it all because they'll feel the need to shut off yeah so it it comes back to that self-awareness doesn't it um, which is something we could all benefit from, I'm sure. So, what about when your um, when your ego takes a hit? Say, when you're in that situation where someone says, you know, you, you maybe you present a song to someone. Um, and I'm sure it's happened to you. It's definitely happened to me many times. Uh, and they just say, nah. And you, you know, and you sort of go, well, what, what's what's? And they just go, I just don't, I just don't like it. Um, critique, you know. How do how do you mm. how do you hand, has that happened to you and how do you handle critique from from people that especially people that you're kind of close with and that you respect? Yeah, um, look, I'll be honest, not well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think anyone handles critique that well. But on saying that, um, I if it, if yeah if I present an idea to someone and they say I don't like it, you know I'm cool with that. That's fine. Like that seems like a totally polite response to me. Um, if it's like what you're playing sounds like shit, you need to shut up. Like <laughs> that's, yeah. that's kind of like, that's, that's a less refined approach of actually like, you know, constructive criticism is really important. Um, if you don't want to hurt someone's feelings, you can make suggestions, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, Maybe even depending on what it is and what the situation is, sometimes it actually is best to say nothing at the time and then sit back and go, actually, do I have a right to be telling them what drum beat to play there or what, you know, yeah. hook to sing there, you know? Yeah. Like, is that my place to do that? And so maybe it's um, it's useful to kind of take a step back every now and then and 
try and get a bit of perspective and um, full circle to what you're saying before about having meetings uh, and discussing these sorts of things and being open and honest and setting that as a precedent from day one so that mm. when you when it does come time to to say hey that drum beat you're playing is is really um not working for the song you can probably find a good way to say it and the drummer will probably be able to you know deal with it reasonably yeah i want to i want to start talking about um the the one man band versus the group band what i mean by that is the the front person or the guitarist or, or you know whatever their role is in the group the person that writes all of the music and they have a backing band um, versus versus you know the the group of writers. Um, there's there's different kind of trains of thought. Um, I want to get your thoughts on it. Do you think one one approach is better or more successful? Uh, I've been involved in both, um, and I think that the one person or you know. Uh, one, what's the word? Dictatorship style <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. leadership bands. Yeah. They can be really, really, really successful, especially quickly, because the person who's planning it has obviously got complete autonomy over all decisions. Usually, uh, regarding like you know marketing and timelines and all that sort of stuff as well. It's usually not just the creative process that they're in charge of. So those bands often uh, get a lot of success really fast and. Um, yeah, necessary, not necessarily um, have longevity because they might lose a lot of members or, along the way. Like, given that people experience working in that environment, decide it's not for them and want to go into another environment. So, yeah, there's a, there's that trade off of like it can be obviously a really great way to work and you can work faster. You don't have to go. What do you think about every little thing? Yeah. Or you know, uh, you just get stuff done you yeah but um in terms of longevity um I can only really think of a few New Zealand bands that run that way that have actually achieved true longevity Mm. um and 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 big success as well like she had for example Mm. um I don't know the inner workings of she had but I've met some of the guys and it seems like they all have their areas of their expertise like rather than being a one person led sure, band. Sure. Sure. And and they're hugely successful and they've yeah. never had, to my knowledge, many lineup changes. Okay, so I like that. So there's you know maybe it can be more effective, um, but maybe you you're not sort of it's it's exclusive, isn't it, that approach? The one the one person dictatorship leadership band. Uh, it's exclusive to everybody else that's not that person. So maybe everyone else probably won't feel like uh, they want to stick around for as long as they would if they were contributing to all you know contributing something even if it's not songwriting um i do think i do think that that distilled you know approach that focused kind of vision yeah definitely will will get you places uh faster but it's not as fun um that brings us to royalty splits yeah so for those who are kind of like royalty splits, what do you mean? I get money for my songs. How do, how does it work? Like when you're in a, a group situation? Yeah, cool. So um, in Australasia, which is the only sort of well, Australia and New Zealand, which is the only area I've operated in, we have APRA and AMCOS, which collect royalties on the behalf of the the writer, um, and you have a hundred percent of each. Each song comes with 100% and you can split that up between however many people in however many ways you would like. Um, if you want to credit five people for writing and playing on a certain recording, you can split that up and divide it up in any way you like. And once you register a song with APRA, um, that any time that song gets played live either by you or someone else or uh, any time it's played on any kind of radio or anything like that, um, then those royalties will get paid out according to those shares that have been nominated uh, when it was initially registered. The other thing is you can have multiple recordings of a different song because people do cover versions and all that sort of thing. 
and and obviously you might do a re-recording of your own song with different people on the instruments. Um, mm. So each time there's a new version, you can you can register it again differently. Um, yeah, and then the other time that I believe they pay royalties is for some venues uh, like that do, for example, the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. Uh, they have a background music playlist in their foyer, and they have a huge amount of foot traffic there millions and millions of people um, every month walking through and they pay an APRA fee based on how many people walk through the building, not not on how often your song is played. So if you're getting a song played, even if it's played every 20 days <laughs> once in a place like that, it doesn't matter because you're getting paid based on foot traffic. So wow. it's definitely worth looking into. Yeah. So, okay, let's, let's, uh, create a hypothetical scenario. Say um, you and I are going to write music together um, and our first song, um, you come to me and, and you've written um, the chords and you've written the um, lyrics for the verse and the chorus um, and you know, you've know you got a pretty much complete song and I say, okay, cool, let's um, maybe change two notes of the melody and this is my idea for the bridge. Um, and then And then, you know, the song takes off. Um, and there's all this money coming in. How do we approach splitting that money? Um, do you, sure. And when do yeah. you talk about it? Well, if the money's coming in from a recording that's been successful, uh, like if you've recorded the song and released it, um, you should probably register it with APRA at the time of recording it, and you should probably have that conversation when you're in that recording process, I guess. Okay, yep. Um that would be my sort of ideal time to have it. Um, how we do things in my band is we actually try to split things as fairly as possible, uh, regardless of input on particular songs. Um, but just because given that we're a small collective of only three people, um, you know, it's, it's easy to do that it, that way. Mm. Um, and then when we've had session players come in to do other instruments, like on our latest record, we, had someone do saxophone and um, some keyboard as well. We've just said to them outright, "This is a session arrangement, and we're, we'll pay you for your time." Um, and yeah, we're not offering a percentage of the royalties of the song. Yep. At this time. Yep. Um, but you know, that's there's no rules for that. You might want to offer them five percent or whatever of the track that they played on. That's fine as well. Mm. I think if money's not changing hands and you're playing on someone else's track, you're probably deserving of a, a slight royalty percentage. And that's performance royalty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so that means <clears throat> even if they go ahead and if you're just a session player and they go ahead and do a tour without you, uh, every time they've played that song live, you'll get your 2% paid back to you. And it might be not much, but it's it's that principal factor, I suppose. Um, whereas if I was to go, I'm going to pay you a certain amount of money to uh, be a session drummer on my album and we came to a financial agreement at the time and you were like, okay, well, I'm happy with not having any any royalties credited to me, then then that's fine as well. But, mm. I mean, that means that later on down the track, if, like you say, the song was successful, that session drummer wouldn't get any cut of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so maybe it's a good idea to protect yourself with contracts and um, and, as you say, talk about it. Talk about it again, openly, uh, being open and honest, um, and talking about it during mm. the recording process. Um, so some artists, uh, you know, apply apply a certain value to a certain part of the song. They might say um, lyrics forty percent, you know, chords forty percent, everything else twenty percent, or you know, that's just a, a wild estimate. Um, and and you know, split them up based on who did what. Um, However, there are some really, really high-profile acts that make an absolute ton of money um, that do what you guys do um, and split it equally. Um, I just did, just from a Google search quickly before, you 2 Red Hot Chili Peppers and Green Day all split everything evenly, even though there are primary songwriters. Um, so I guess having an agreement is, is probably quite important. Yeah, totally. I mean, you can start with just a short verbal agreement or a short email if you need to have it written. It doesn't have to be. I, I'm obviously when you're talking about the kind of money that those bands are making, it becomes a lot more serious. 
um, <laughs> for average person um, out there trying to make music in bands, like I would say just come to um, a basic agreement mm. when you're either starting the project or joining the project of what your share is going to be. Yeah, yeah. So that um, comes down to value as well um, and making sure that, you know, it's another way to keep your band harmonious is making sure that everyone feels valued and feels valuable in the project. Have you got any words on, on how to how to kind of encourage that? Yeah, well, um, I guess from the point of view of somebody coming into your project, like we've recently got a new drummer and um, that's great because we've had a few session drummers in between and it's been kind of hard because they were really busy with other projects as much as we've loved having them. Yeah. Um, and to bring on our new drummer, it was kind of like, yeah, we're just really looking for someone who wants to like be a part of the band and, you know, like be like a, a full part of the band and actually kind of contribute and rather than just turn up and play drums. And um, just to put that on the table at the start <laughs> and to be like, is that what you are, are here for? Mm. Um, or, or do you just want to turn up and play drums? Like it's a bit intense, I guess, for some people as well to have that initial conversation um, straight up and yeah, it can be uncomfortable, but I mean, I've personally as a bassist been in a situation where I kind of, <laughs> I joined as a fill in because somebody quit. And then two years later I was like, so am I in the band? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and, and like, so that can be, yeah, kind of, I guess if you can break the ice initially when you start to collaborate, that's ideal um, if you're a person that's questioning your role in the band, maybe you can initiate it. Like if you're dealing with people who aren't comfortable with the confrontation of, of having that conversation mm. and you, you just kind of want to know what they're planning on doing, <laughs> um, whether you're going to be replaced or, or whether you're a permanent, you know, how they feel about keeping you on and maybe just approach them and, um, yeah, just have the conversation. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. And that's the podcast for this week. Thank you so much to my guest, Laura Thompson. You can check out Laura's solo project, Mistake, at facebook.com forward slash M-S-T-A-K-E music. The artist of the week this week is Laura's band Cheshire Grimm. Check them out at cheshiregrimm.net and facebook.com forward slash Cheshire Grimm with two M's. You can find their latest EP, Rain or Shine, on Spotify, and look out for their new video coming out for the song Slave to Grind. You'll find all the links I've mentioned in the podcast description. This podcast and my site, musiciansmap.org, is dedicated to sharing knowledge and advice about music and the music industry. It's all about honesty and positive progress. My experience and the experience and advice of my guests is yours to learn from. There are no hidden meanings, ambiguous statements, or industry secrets, just people helping each other to be better and achieve results. Much of my experience, advice, and information is condensed into both ebook and audiobook form, both of which are available on the website, as well as Amazon and Audible, respectively. In the book, I discuss every aspect of learning music, from listening and learning an instrument, to recording, gigging, touring, and making money as a musician. You can get a free sample of both the ebook and the audiobook on the Musicians Map website. I've also got a brand new free ebook, How to Get Your Music Heard. Go to musiciansmap.org forward slash free dash book to get your copy. If you have a suggestion for the podcast or for the YouTube channel, or you just want some advice, get in touch via the Musicians Map Facebook group or by email at kane at musiciansmap.org. I always respond. Thanks for listening and stay positive. Music